Hello and welcome to Bird Barrier. My name is Michael Gallion and today we are going to be talking about gulls. We uh, just finished up a session on pigeons and now we're going to start with gulls. A uh, few things I want to mention about these bird specific sessions that we are doing is that we, we aren't giving out individual certificates for each one of these, but if you do go through all six of these over the next few days, then there will be a certificate at the end showing that you completed all six of these. Uh, gulls is next, we did pigeons. Tomorrow we will be doing mud swallows and woodpeckers, and then on Thursday, uh, swallows, uh, no, sparrows and starlings. So uh, let's get into the gulls here. Uh, you notice I'm saying gull and not seagull. That's one thing that ornithologists really get angry. <laughs> Pet peeve is that there's, you know, there's really no such thing as a seagull. Gulls, by their biological nature, of course, are by water. And they're, they will be by oceans and lakes and, you know, especially out here in Southern California, they're everywhere. Uh, but they're just called gulls. That's the type of bird that these are. Lars Pacificus is the example we have here. Um, they will generate about three more offspring per year, and they live a long time. They live for about 25 years, even in the uh, harsh setting of, of the oceans and climates like that. They're a very hardy bird. Let's take a look at this video that shows a little bit more in detail about how these gulls live. Greater black-backed and herring gulls breed on Appledore Island off the New England coast. Here the gulls court, mate, nest, and fledge young, all in three short months. But these two species are both predators, eating anything they can catch, kill, and tear apart, including other gulls. How can thousands of birds, each a potential predator on the eggs and chicks of their neighbors, coexist on a 95-acre island? The answer? These birds have evolved a complex system of social signals that keeps violence to a minimum. The gulls use these signals to carve out and hold small territories spaced just four to five meters apart across the rocky island. Territoriality begins when males arrive in spring, followed closely by their mates returning to the same patch of rock they held in past years. These experienced pairs strut about, inspecting the site for appropriate nesting spots and reinforcing territorial boundaries. Boundaries must be constantly defended. An interloper or neighbor approaching another's territory is met with a series of signals or displays intended to drive him away. This is a long call. In a territorial context, the long call is a threat directed at trespassers. The mew is also used in territorial disputes, often calling in support from a mate. The kek kek is used when the colony is disturbed or in boundary disputes. The yao serves these same two functions. This visual display is an upright posture. The upright posture is rigid, neck stretched up and forward, head pointed slightly down. Wings are cocked forward and slightly off the sides, poised to attack. Still more aggressive is the charge display, a ritualized attack that is amplified by outstretched wings, 
making the charging gull appear larger. Fights happen in spite of the signaling system. But fights are risky, as severe injury to a parent will doom their eggs and chicks. Over evolutionary time, selective pressure on individuals has favored communication over conflict, resulting in a signaling system that reduces violence in the breeding colony. Okay, so uh, very common pest bird. And, you know, from the video where you saw at the beginning there, they showed how there are different territorial sections. I think that's one of the keys to understanding gulls when you're trying to treat these and you're, you're trying to solve a problem, is to understand that there are very specific mating pairs that are covering a particular section of the roof. And you have to look closely at their nesting and where they're really hanging out because those little uh, two or three meter areas that they call their own territory is you have to focus specifically on those areas. And from this slide we see here uh, that I have with the nest, you know, it's that main nesting area you really want to focus in on when you're treating them. Even though they tend to go all over all the different surfaces of the structure, you want to really focus in on their territories. Now these are protected, so as I mentioned earlier, you cannot touch the eggs, you cannot uh, alter their nest or anything until the birds have vacated those nests. Now that could be several weeks, even months before the birds are gone from their nesting or they've reproduced that, you know, the, the colony has gone through its, its reproductive phase then you definitely want to clean off all the nest and then treat it properly, but then you have to go in and do additional treatments to prevent them from returning. Um, now, sometimes you can get permits uh, to go in and addle the eggs. That's where, where you actually alter the egg in a way so that it won't uh, produce any results. Uh, but uh, in general, from a strategic viewpoint, you really don't want to harm the eggs or the birds. You want to let them fledge and then deal with them in off times in terms of solving the problem. But it is a serious threat. Uh, uh, these birds can be a serious threat to humans. As we talked about, the disease vectors and their droppings, especially we see things on rooftops like the HVAC intakes. This is a great way to transfer a lot of disease to the interior of a building and you have to be very careful with those uh, sort of areas. The physical damage from these birds can be pretty extensive. The droppings are very uh, you know, acidic, very corrosive, and the birds physically are strong. You do not want to mess with these birds either. They are very aggressive at defending their areas. They will really uh, do a lot of damage in the same way that pigeons will damage the branding of a of a retail business, restaurants, you know, uh, shopping centers, the droppings, and then just the association of these birds is looked at as a negative in terms of business. So it has that, that sort of impact on the brand. Very strong reclaim, just like we mentioned pigeons, these birds do not give up easily. They will keep coming back unless you, you use the right type of treatment. And that's because of the imprinting. The pheromones uh, that they leave, especially in their territories that identify the mating couple, they transition into resident birds of that particular facility. So even though we build them for humans, the birds assume that that is now their permanent residence and they will not give up easily. Up to four eggs per nest, they're usually flat nest also on the roofs. They're very, they don't really make anything all that big in terms of protection because the birds sit in the wide open. This is one of the few birds that you will find where they don't really require overhead protection in order to carry out their nesting. And so the nests will be relatively flat, just enough so that the eggs don't uh, roll around in the wind and can stay put during the incubation phase until they, they uh, hatch. 
They will uh, fledge after about five to six weeks. So there's a long period as the, the chicks grow to adult size. And even after that, they will hang around the colony for you know, several weeks or even months before the colony decides to go off somewhere else. And that gives you the opportunity to do the treatment. Again, the parents are very aggressive. Uh, true story I have on this subject is uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a student that came to the class, and this is before we did the live webcast. In this room here, we would do live training. We have 20 or 30 people at a time come in and do the training class, and there was a, a person who learned all about this. Now, I gave this specific inf information that you do not touch the eggs. You'd have to have a special permit. But he had a seagull job. I said seagull when it really should be gull, right? Had a gull job down there in San Diego, and it was up high on a ledge. So he had to come down on a, on a, on a chair off of the roof. It's a very precarious position. Now, this is a window cleaning company, and he was used to doing that sort of thing. But he called me from up on the building and was in a panic, and I could hear... I could hear the aggressive gulls just, you know, really making tons of noise. He says he's being attacked. I said, well, what, do you, what did you do? And he says, well, I took the eggs out of the, out of the nest. I was cleaning everything up. And I said, put, you know, put the eggs back. Put the eggs back right away and get out of there. You know, he could have gotten in trouble. He could get it fine. It's a very dangerous situation. But those parents can be very, very aggressive. And uh, they could have, I suppose, knocked him off the building to get those eggs back. So be warned, you don't want to get in their business in any way, shape, or form. Let the, the eggs hatch, let the, uh, the uh, birds leave the nest, and then do your thing with them. Droppings, here's what the droppings look like. Uh, they're mostly white, mostly very liquid compared to pigeons where you get a lot of more uh, you know, solid matter. These are, are, you know, the kind of messes that are everywhere from gulls. We see the gull droppings on, you know, these solar panels. That's a, depending on the type of solar panel, you get a lot of activity going up there. Uh, trapping. We generally don't trap gulls. I mean, some people would, if you got a permit and there was a special situation where the particular gulls are going to create some kind of fire damage in a utility situation, maybe, but generally trapping is not allowed. These are protected species. So as with other birds, you don't want to just treat the symptom areas. Maybe we keep them off the outer ledges of a building, but if you're not dealing with the nesting and eliminating the infestation of the entire colony, you're not going to solve them. So the key to solving gulls is by eliminating the nesting, whatever that structure is that's causing them to nest on a regular basis, you need to figure out a way to solve that. Again, the strategy checklist is pretty much the same for just about every bird. We need to know for sure if they're nesting or not. Therefore, if it's high pressure, that means they're nesting. If they're just loafing and they haven't laid eggs or anything, that's medium pressure. Give us really good photos of the, of the droppings, the nesting, or any, anything important, up, especially up on the flat roofs, the measurements, and then the Google address. A lot of times with gulls, we're going to go on that Google image. We're going to look at the entire roof because the entire roof becomes the solution in order to solve these. Now, gulls have a very specific you know, strategy to them, and there are deterrents that you can use. Daddy long legs are very, very effective. They actually work in high pressure for gulls. In other words, if we were to put one of these down in the nesting area, in general, that's going to do the job. Now, they're just going to move to another area, and if you've got a whole roof, it depends on what the situation is, how big that roof is. It may not be cost effective, but many times it is. So this is a very good deterrent to keep in mind if you have a gull problem. The next major step is sort of a, a netting concept, but it's called grid wire. Grid wire is where we create a system of poles and wires, and if you create this sort of false ceiling, the birds hate to get underneath this. They have a fear of getting trapped underneath, and especially gulls. This is why they sit on a flat roof. They have 
They can have a wide open view of all predators. They, have a, they, they know what their escape is. And also, all of the gulls work together to uh, attack any predators that come in and start to mess with their, their nursery areas where they're breeding and have eggs. Here is a more detailed look at, at, gull, at the grid wire for gulls. You see that there's like main big heavy gauge cables that are roughly about 30 feet apart. And within that, a smaller grid of roughly six feet with you know, less expensive thin wire material. That's all it takes. Now this is a construction job. This can be pretty much uh, you know, all about tools and your knowledge of, of, of structure. There's some engineering that goes into this because you can't just you know, attach and then start cranking cables. You're gonna put a big load on the rooftop structure, so you have to know what you're doing before you do something like this. Um, it looks like there's a questionnaire. How much time do we have between the fledglings leave the nest and the where, where the parrots lay more eggs? Okay, that's a good question. In Southern California, there are typically about two different breeding cycles per year. As we go into colder climates, like uh, in, uh, let's say, Michigan, there will be one main breeding season. So in the case of the winter situation, you'll have several months before the birds return. When it comes to Southern California, after the, the uh, birds have fledged the nest, you typically need to act between two and three months maximum. So don't plan any further than three months ahead. As a matter of fact, look at you know, the condition of the youngest uh, in that uh, particular colony and then plan accordingly. I usually like to come in about 90 days and then start the entire cleanup process and then put in some kind of deterrent system. Uh, another good deterrent uh, for these birds is flex track, especially on the outer ledges in different areas. In general, gulls get really fooled by this deterrent. Uh, sometimes just putting it around the parapet ledge is enough to keep them off the entire roof because they might believe that uh, the entire roof is electrified. Once they get a couple shocks on the highest points of that roof, they don't even want to take a risk at landing again on any part of the roof. Sometimes that will work just to uh, solve the parapet ledges. Many times if they're nesting though, they've already nested, you're going to have to go into those individual nest areas. Eagle eye can be effective. Eagle Eye is a system of reflecting uh, spinning devices. They're solar powered, there's also wind powered, but uh, you have to treat the nesting first. You have to get rid of all the nesting, treat it in such a way that they can't reclaim their nesting. Then you add something like Eagle Eye in and it's gonna reduce the airspace of the birds around. Here's an example of a roof. Once, uh, you know, these roosting uh, gulls, once the cleanup was done, you know, they hadn't really nested on this roof, and this became a great solution to keep them off from that point forward. Of course, netting off is always a, a solid solution for all types of birds, but there could be too many costs involved. And then, of course, optical gel is a great solution for gulls as well, but there's a very specific way of treating that nesting area. Not only do you put this into the nesting area, but you want to attach it to bricks because these birds get very aggressive and they're known to actually attack the optical gel disc. They get very angry. They don't like the disc. They get very aggressive. They can loosen the disc and they'll throw them around if they can pry them off, especially if the glue, the adhesive hasn't set. So gluing these to bricks, letting them set up when you get to the work site, and then setting these bricks down and taking off the lids in that nesting area, great solution. It can actually solve an entire roof. We have more details on that on our website under the optical gel section. We have these bird specific solutions. So that covers the deterrents. We've covered the territorial biology of what's going on. These birds like to nest on flat open roofs, you know. They, uh, they aren't afraid of predators because 
on the flat roof, they look up, and if they see any other predatory bird come in, they're one of the few birds that will team together and do a complete uh, team defense of, of a bird like a falcon or something like that. Now, falcons, they're pretty much on their own. If there's a falcon in trouble with gull, you know, it's going to deal with five or six gulls. Those gulls will kill predatory birds, and, and they fight to uh, keep their territory safe. So again, that covers, that covers the basics that come into play with gulls. If you're in pest control, bird control specialist, you uh, have enough knowledge about this bird now uh, to, to know how they act and behave. Does anybody have any questions? If you have questions about gulls specifically, or you have a job that you're getting ready to do with gulls and you wanna ask some questions, now would be a good time. So I'm gonna wait a minute or two and look for any questions. I have, a, I have a sample job that I want to show you that we can look at, but first I just want to make sure there aren't any other questions out there. How did we do on this one? Did we uh, cover the enough info? Are these, so far, if you've been on both of these, is this enough information for you that helps you with these birds? You know, let, let us know. If you want even more detailed information, of course, we can get back to you on those details. Okay, I don't see any questions, Zach, coming into the, uh, coming into the, uh, I do see a comment here, thanks for sharing important information on pigeon gold, excellent info, very good coverage. All right, good, so those are positives. Uh, before we go, I want to show you, I'm going to share my phone here, and I'm going to quiz you guys just to see if this, uh, if, if, you know, what you can learn uh, from this. Or if, you know, there are some people out there that are very good at bird control, and maybe you encounter a site like this. And I want you to take a look at uh, these uh, videos from a site that I visited not too long ago. They said, man, these gulls are just, they're landing on top of all of these, these light poles, and the droppings are horrendous. Now, what happened with this particular site was... Uh, the rest of the property was treated and roofs were, were excluded to where the nesting was taken care of. And then they started moving in on all of these lights. And it became the main congregating area every day for these gulls. Now, here's another video I'll show you just how bad the droppings were. You can see this is uh, after about one week or two weeks before they power washed this parking lot. And you see how bad this can get. There's a lot of coverage right down the middle of this parking lot. And the goals would not only land on the lights up there, you know, that was, but they would, some of them would come down to this surface and congregate. One of the things that would happen is these gulls would actually come in from one direction. You know, we were called out there to look at it, and I think it's in this video here. I'm going to play this one again. All right, right down there, that far end, I'm going to pause it right here. You see where that lift is down at the end of the parking lot. There's a tech, and he's working on the cleanup, they cleaned up from one end to the other and got rid of all the droppings, of course. Um, but that wall, where we see the tech at the far end where the lift is, was an area, the direction that the birds would arrive from every day. They'd come in from that direction. They'd first start to land on that wall and they'd go up to the lights. So now that you've seen these videos, what do you think was the recommended solution for this? Now I see Matt says medium pressure loafing daddy long legs on each tower using optical gel on the parking barriers okay that's good sheldon. Uh, sh yeah sheldon says daddy long legs on the lights might keep them from staging and recloading so both of those both of those are correct and then the wall should have flex track that is exactly right matt evans shout out to you man so that far wall that uh, we, we showed did get flex track. 
And that was, well, you know, a very good strategy. They didn't have to shock track the whole system. And man, that really freaked out these birds because as they came into land, the first thing they encountered was the shock on that, on that wall. And that makes them double back and there's a state of alert that goes out. These birds talk to each other. Then when they flew up to the towers, instead of the daddy long legs, which is what we, 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 uh, we did recommend daddy long legs, but we also uh, used some optical gel on some of them. And both the daddy long leg and optical gel were both very effective. And the customer was totally uh, okay with the daddy long legs. So in this case, the daddy long legs were even better. The combination of daddy long legs and the shock track so far after about uh, six months is holding very well. Uh, the birds just don't really feel comfortable if they can't get to their high spots first. Even if they can go down to the ground level, uh, this is not where they're gonna nest. They're not gonna nest on a deck where their cars are driving and come in every day. Uh, you know, most people didn't want to, want to actually uh, park up there because of the amount of droppings, but once it was clean, uh, everything was fine. So now Carol says, don't forget the flex track warning labels as that wall is, no, that's very good. Carol, thank you for that. Yes, if you ever have shock track like that on a wall, and they, we did install those, uh, that you know, the installer did do that, uh, you do want to leave the warnings. You don't want people going over and accidentally putting their hand on the, on the shock track wall and getting, getting jolted. So very good. Uh, that, that pretty much covers what we had for gulls. Hopefully this has been helpful. We covered some basic biology of gulls, but you know, for, for the most part, you're either going to uh, be treating some hotspot areas, and I find that optical gel can be very effective in little hotspot areas. Now, another technology that we're incorporating in as well, and we're going through our final phases of testing, are laser technology. Lasers are improving all the time. They're becoming more affordable. They're becoming programmable. And not on a parking garage like I showed you here, but on a rooftop area where there's no human activity, where the danger of lasers, uh, you know, coming in contact with humans. Not that they're going to be that powerful, but they certainly can be dangerous to the eyes. Uh, we are doing more and more experiments and, and we'll reveal more information coming soon about our lasers for these type of birds as well. Um, if there are any other questions, the way to get a hold of me, uh, my name again is Michael Gallion. You can, here's my email, Zach, if you can put that up there, you can email me directly uh, for any questions that you have about bird specific jobs. You remember the checklist that I showed you earlier uh, where we want to see photos and, and all the dimensions, you can email those to me. Uh, we, we have in the east coast of the United States, uh, we have uh, also Ray, who is our East Coast tech. He's based out of Baltimore, and he goes to sites. But for right now, uh, most of what we're, we're converting to is this online live training. And then also, there's a lot more coming in terms of being able to do virtual inspections. So, so for those of you are, who are out there, and you've got a site, and you're not sure about how to do the inspection, you can actually FaceTime me. We usually ask that you set up an appointment where you FaceTime me. We'll set up a time when you're going to be there. I'll block out a window out of my schedule. And then it's as if I'm there. And that being there with you while you're doing inspection can be very effective in terms of uh, helping you strategically solve the problem. Uh, again, my name is Michael Gallion. Uh, and tomorrow we have... Woodpeckers and mud swallows, a little more interesting, I think, than today. So, yeah, that Bobby says, excited about the woodpecker talk. I've got uh, all kinds of stories. But, you know, I will say one thing about woodpeckers is that there was a time where bird bearer would just say, don't even bother. You're not going to make any money. We recommend you just stay away from those. And now there's so much more technology involved to make it profitable. Like, so all of these birds can be profitable for everyone out there. And that's what it's all about, helping you succeed. 
So until the next one tomorrow, uh, we will... 11 a.m. Pacific time, Zach says. So same time we started today with the pigeons, and we will uh, see you tomorrow. All right, thanks a lot.